how to understand the love of the Lord when he gives you more trial. For example, in my personal life, I have more trial than anything else. Try to have a baby we cannot have. And we are here going to the temple, doing every single thing we are supposed to do. And nobody can help you, only him. How to understand that? Okay, I repeat. Everybody can have what she wants or something better. Now you want children, rightfully so. The tragedy, the modern tragedy of abortions, for example, being what they are in a world filled with sisters and brothers like you who want children. That is something I'm sure God is going to have a long conversation with some people about. But setting that aside, you're falling into a trap that I want everybody in this room to avoid. And that is, God must not love me if I suffer. I must be being penalized if I suffer. I must be doing something wrong or I can't get an answer to my prayer or I can't find the solution to my problem because it's just one trial after another. Can you see the danger of thinking that way? Every person I know in this book suffers. And here's... Are you ready for this? may not be the most encouraging thought you've ever had in your life. The more righteous you are, the more suffering there is. Find what we cannot say is when we suffer, God does not love us. We have to say, Thy will be done. And know when we don't know, when there are things we do not know, remember this forever. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this. When there are times and questions where we do not know the answer, cling to the ones that you do know. And we know that God loves us. We know that God is merciful. We know He is just. He does not turn a blind eye. He does not turn a deaf ear. He is not unmindful of your tears or your sorrow or your desire to have a child. He is all of that and more and more and more. So that's what you cling to when there are questions where you just don't have another answer. Hang on to the things you do know. And above all and through all and overarching all is God's love for his children. If who suffered more than anyone in time or eternity that we know of, whatever the plan was, who suffers more than is speakable, than is expressible, than is comprehensible, than is absorbable, than is graspable? The living Son of the living God, the only perfect child who ever lived. Don't ever, please, please do not fall victim to the temptation to say, well, I guess God doesn't love me. Because what on earth would that say about his love for his only begotten son? We're going to say that? We're going to say that he's turned his back? on the only perfect, obedient child he's ever had? Not likely. Not very darn likely. So, these are times for faith. These are times for perseverance. Life is filled with times of trouble. That somehow, and this is the part that I don't, fully understand and I don't ask you to just blissfully accept it and glide out of the room but there is something at work in suffering 
that is exalting. Now that is not news anybody particularly wants to hear today. But I think it somehow must be doctrinal. That suffering is exalting. I don't know whether that's because it makes us more patient with others. Does it make us more sympathetic with other people who've got troubles? Does it make us more inclined to be godlike so that when our own kids in some universe somewhere are having a bad day, we can talk about it, we can remember? Is it part of our sympathy? Is it part of the expanding of our heart to where we're not smug and we're not self-centered and we're not trivial? I don't know. I, 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 I think it's probably all of that. I think it's probably all of that, maybe, and more. But it is hard to read these, and it is impossible to read the life of the Savior without coming to the conclusion that suffering somehow is preparatory to exaltation because of the end product. So hang on. Just hang on and say your prayers and trust in the Lord.